This is the fourth week on a warning call from a loving God. We'll just read a few verses so as we can get really into it. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 1 says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. Then it goes on to say about cutting down trees and making idols and so on. Go to verse 6, please. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O King of nations? For to thee doth it appertain for as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee, and they are altogether brutish and foolish. Their stock is a doctrine of vanity. Go to verse 10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting King. At his wrath the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall you say unto them, the gods that is a small g, you'll notice, not gods at all, the gods that have not made the heavens and earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Father, take your word and again we ask you to Inscribe it upon our hearts, imprint it upon our minds, and enable us, Lord, to take your word in its fullness, whether it be easy or whether it be not. We pray in Jesus' name that you would give us grace to receive the engrafted word which is able to save the soul. For Jesus' name's sake we pray. Amen. I think the first week was a general overview of what had happened in the chapter where the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom, and now Israel is gone. Now Judah is in captivity or going into captivity. Pardon me. The, the judgment is upon them to go into captivity, and Israel are in captivity, the northern kingdom. And they've taken on the way of the heathen. They've brought the heathen into not only into their nation, but they've brought the heathen into their place of worship. And the Lord has warned them and told them because he loves them. And brothers and sisters, you and I could uh, witness the people even today in our land and in Northern Ireland and Ulster, and we could witness anywhere. And because we tell people truth of God's word, it's, this is an antiquated book, you're full of hate, you're bigoted, and all these sort of things where really, if they listen to the message, it's because God loves them and you love them too. It's nothing to do with hate or hurt. Remember, we talked about even abortion issues. We talked about the LGBT issue and all of those sort of things. Always remember that no matter who they are, that's someone's son. That's someone's daughter. That's someone's mother or father or whoever. That's someone's family member. And that person is a soul. A, a soul, a person who hurts. A person who feels and, you know, it can be at times seem hard on them, but really it should be love for them. It should always be because you love them. You can hate what they do, but love them as a person. And we can see here how the Lord has sent the, the apostles, or pardon me, the prophets to Israel. And here Israel now, Judah, all of Israel are just turning away from him. And so the Lord always says, look, I want them to turn because I love them, because God is holy, and holiness can't abide sinfulness. Holiness cannot abide sinfulness. It's like night and day. They do not mix together. And the Lord says it through love. Unfortunately, when we bring this even into the very uh, modern era, if you want, the church tells everyone it's all love, 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 love. And everyone says, well, if God loves me, then I'll be all right. 
God is love, and I've, we've mentioned that throughout times, the, the exact term is used twice by John. Um, in 1 John 4, um, he uses it twice, God is love, God is love. And that's true, that's an attribute of God, it's attributed to God. God abides in, a, if you want, a condition and a state, a characteristic of love. I want to look at it in a moment, because that's true. And we get the, the saying where, uh, perfect love casts out fear for there is no fear in love for fear hath torment that's true if you're in the perfect love if you're living in that perfect love that's true but the Spirit spoke this morning and the very first line of it was the exact line word for word that I had to bring just before Aaron spoke over you know what the very first word was because it hit me like a freight train as soon as he said I said Lord this is exactly the same Reverence, respect. No matter, you know, if you love someone, you will reverence them. If you love someone, you will respect them. And, you know, if your husband or your wife says they love you and they don't reverence and respect you, then you can question that love. Notice this God is love. And I'm going to say it again, but love is not all that God is. God's attributes go way beyond that. In other words, there's far too many dimensions. Notice God uh, in our part when we looked at the state of the nation and how the heathen, as it were, come in and it's, you know, learn not the way of the heathen and also don't practice their customs as it's said in Jeremiah 10 and we've seen how that's come into our nation our nation has fallen away from being a, a nation that even went to church if you want, even though it's not salvation but uh, 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 the churches were full it was a Christian nation even nominally where the, the word of God was the foundation of the nation the commandments of God was the foundation of our laws in the nation but how far has the nation gone they learned the way of the heathen and they started to practice their customs and the thing was that the, the salt in the nation was always the church the salt in the nation was always the church the preacher the firebrand and they, they may have got laughed at by many but nevertheless many listen many uh, uh, would heed the word of God and many were saved we had revivals God sent revivals through it but nowadays now it is. You, you know, and I'm not saying this to try. I mean, we get great turnouts, um, especially on nice sunny days like this and holiday times coming up. But, uh, so I'm not saying this to, to try and bring condemnation in or make anyone feel bad. But it used to be that for a Sunday night, the church were out on Sunday morning remembering the Lord, or getting blessed and built up in their faith, and going out, and all week they labored to bring people on a Sunday night to church. They labored. They never ceased asking, asking uh, and trying. They labored to try and bring people out in the church. They get them under the sound of the word, not because church saves you, but, but get them under the sound of the word. But here's the thing. Now it's trying to get the believers to come out to church <laughs> on a Sunday night. Trying to get the believers to come out to, to Bible study and so on. It's try, prayer meetings, trying to get the believers. That's the state of the church is becoming. But now look. We looked also at not only the nation, we looked at the preachers last week, if you remember. What preachers are preaching is the soft shoe, uh, candy floss, um, flower power gospel. And it's not the true gospel. And whenever they're saying everything is going to be fine, look at the state of the church. Is it just me? Or are we seeing the spirit that's looming over is now entering the church? Do you know just this weekend? Just this weekend. A man sent me photographs, posted them to me. Of, I'll, I'll not mention because I just don't think it would be fair, but two churches in North Antrim. One last night had a meeting in a pub on beer tasting. Craft beer tasting it was. And another one had a table out in the middle of the town of Carrick Fergus with... Um, the rainbow flags over it, flying the rainbow flags and saying we're having meetings for the gay community. Do 
Now, as I said, it's not to try and offend or hurt anyone, but the reason why I'm saying this is, there's where the church is. Where's the standard of holiness? Where's the standard of righteousness being in God's word? That was just this weekend. Just during the week, there was um, an ecumenical service where everybody got involved in the United States. They brought every religion together, and they all thought it was great because it was a peaceful religion. You know, a gathering, I should say, together. And look, I'm all for peace. I'm not for violence and war. And, you know, I believe there's just wars and unjust wars, but I'm for peace. But I'm also for being... I know I'm I'm up for it when as soon as I say this. I'm a separatist. I'm a separatist. In the sense that I believe the church should be separate from all other things. So we preach God as love, but we show the wrath of God. God is angry. I believe God is angry with the United Kingdom. I believe God is angry with the Republic of Ireland after their vote. And the way little old Ulster, Northern Ireland is going, I believe God is angry the way it's going. So whenever we say, whenever we, or I say, you know, we have to, show the love of God, by all means, that's where we go. We show them the love of God and the manifestation of that love through Calvary. But also we must tell them and warn them of the wrath to come. We have to. Because if God's all love, 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 then I'm going to get the party gates, as it were, and St. Peter's going to open the, the gate, and he's going to welcome me, and I'm going to see everyone else that was unsaved, who never knew Christ, all those, because it was also all love. Yet Jesus was the, uh, the, if I can use the word, the, the most prominent hellfire preacher in all of the scriptures. Jesus whipped them out of the temple. I wonder if that Jesus came in here today, would they think, no, you're not the same Jesus. You're not the same one. You know, whenever we look at this, verse 7, who would not fear thee, O king of nations? This four-part series up, to, to, up till today is, this one line is what jumped out at me before I started this series. Just this one line. Who would not fear thee? Let me tell you who doesn't fear him. Those who are dead and in their sins. Let me tell you who else doesn't fear him. Those who are blinded by the devil. Let me tell you who else doesn't fear him. Those who have not really come to a knowledge of who he is and his holiness. So this morning, let's look at the church. The preacher and myself got a kick in last week, didn't they? Let's look at the church. That's you. That's me, still. First of all, God is love. Let's deal with it. Romans chapter 5. And let's just let our eye run down to verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice this one verse. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice, much more than being now. This is the church, the sea, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now look at verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now let me put this into a little nutshell. Everyone outside of Christ are the enemy of God. And everyone in Christ are reconciled back to God and his son. They are justified, just as if they had never sinned. So if everyone is an enemy outside of Christ, guess what? That enemy is going to be dealt with. Doesn't that make sense? But God showed his love. Yes, he did. 
but they refuse his love, they reject his love, they turn away from his love. And what was his love? The shedding of the blood of his son on Calvary's tree. Christ at the center of it all. And he says, here is the only thing that I will recognize is the blood of my son. And they turn him away. When you pass there a lot of years, you meet a lot of people. You hear a lot of things. A lot of blessed stories and good stories. You meet lovely families. You also meet those who are fooling themselves. I mean, there's people fool themselves and they say, well, pastor, this, that, and the other, and they're going, yeah, well, it's all right. You know. And you're just reading right through them. And you get a depth of someone's spirituality by speaking to them and pastoring them. And you get a depth of where they are in God. And I'm going to make a statement. I don't want you panicking here, okay? There's people sitting in church and they're not saved. Some form of religion, but in their heart they're dead. You see, when a man and woman come to Christ, he quickens them. I'll talk about that tonight if you come out. He quickens, he makes them alive. Alive to what? Alive to him. So when you talk about him, or you talk about his word, or you see them in their life, they change. They are different. Because they're alive. There's people and they're just dead. Nothing in them of Christ. God commendeth his love toward us. That while we were yet sinners, in other words, when Ken Davidson was who Ken Davidson was, and that's a lot I can't and won't talk about now, and so much more, that he loved me, don't ask me why, but he loved me and he gave himself for me. When I was yet a sinner, when you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. It didn't say whenever you got religious or when you changed your ways or you had great willpower and cleaned up your act. It meant when you were the deepest died sinner, the enemy of God, dead in your sins and your trespasses, unable to save yourself, he had already died for you and shed his blood. Now that's love. Look, I have people tell me how much they love me all the time. Love you, pastor. I go, yeah, okay. And many of the ones who exclaim it are the first ones to. Now listen. Love isn't what you say, love is what you do. I'm not talking about me and you now, I'm talking about what God has done. Love isn't what you say, love is what you do. For example, when God commended his love, the word synestomy is for the word commendeth. And synestomy means, listen, to place together, to set in the same place, to present or to exhibit or to show, to stand with, to stand near, to put together, to unite parts into one whole. Let me just put it in a nutshell for you now. That while I was the enemy of God, while I was sitting in the old Shabines, the Paramount Shabines, While I was up to my antics and up to no good, while I was getting on the way I was getting on, when I was in my state of euphoria, out of my head on drugs, when I had murder in my heart, Christ had died for me. God commendeth his love. God's love stood beside me, in other words. God's love stood for me. God's love stood with me. God's love united me. All I had to do was realize it, accept it, believe it. 
But notice this. In verse 8 he says, While we were yet sinners, we were. That's our state. That's who we were. But now in Christ, what are we now? We are righteous. We are righteous. We are justified. We are declared just before the Father. In other words, he says, Ken Davidson, no sin do I see in him. You know why? Because I'm in Christ. Now notice this. It's past tense. And the idea here is why we were yet sinners. See the term yet sinners. We were yet sinners. It means why we were devoted to sin. Brothers and sisters, why we were devoted to sin. Why we were preeminently, in other words, it was the first thing in our lives, it was the, the chiefest thing in our life was to sin. Why we were especially wicked, it means. Why we were, listen, heathen-like, learn not the way of the heathen, the Lord says. Why we were heathen-like, why we missed the mark, while we broke the law of God, God gave his son to die for us that his love would stand with a wretch like me. I'm like you. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, please. First Corinthians chapter six. Let's write on down to verse nine. Notice what it says here. Now Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I want this to be read. Notice the next three words. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor extortioners. Look, he's, Paul is gathering so many things together here. Notice what he says in verse 11 to the church. And such were some of you. Notice, were. You're changed. You're different. Past tense. Past life. Yet the Corinthian church was one of the most sinful, vilest churches, and the gifts of the Spirit was still flowing. How do you work that out? That's what the letter was written for. You can't have holiness and sinfulness. That's why Paul was writing the letters. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Notice, I will not be brought under the power of anything, but the Holy Ghost is saying. See the word power, it's the word exousia. Exousia, that means the authority. So every time... We allow, whether it's our attitudes, listen, or our loss, whether it's our temperaments, or whether it's how we've lived our lives in certain things, in certain manners, they have the authority. It's having the authority over the Christian's life. You're giving it authority. It's the word authority, license. So what is having license over your life? How you speak? 
curse words. You can't control your mouth. Bitter heart. Sinfulness. Any of the list that we've just read out. Paul says, listen, all things are lawful to me, but I will not be brought under the power of any of them. My life is sold out for Christ. Why would your life be sold out for Christ? Is that not too radical? Let me tell you what's radical. And I say it with reverence to the Savior. That he would come all the way from glory and die for someone I'm only after speaking about like me. So notice here, 1 Corinthians 15. Let's stay in the same book. Just a little verse to lift out. Let's write one down, please, the verse. 34. Let me just get a drink while you're looking that up. Let's go to verse 33. Be not deceived. There he is again. Don't be deceived. It's love, love, love. Live how you like. Do what you want. It's under the blood. We're all in grace. It's not what the scriptures tell us. Of course we're all in grace. I need grace every day. But notice what he says here in verse 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness. And sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Wow. I remember I listened to a really old recording um, of... John Alexander Dow from, well, he was Scottish, but he went to, he built the city of Zion, Illinois, in the United States. And someone had got a really old, crackly, you have to put your ear down, it's really, it's like a hundred and something years old. Somebody got him recorded. And he was preaching, you know what he was saying to them? I couldn't preach the way he preached because if I did, nobody would want to sit in their seat. You definitely wouldn't come out tonight. Nor Tuesday night, nor next week. He called his congregation a pile of stink pots. <laughs> Even for chewing tobacco, he says, you chew the filth in your mouth and you spit it on the street, you're a stink pot. Get yourself right with God, he says. Allison heard it with me. Here's the thing, that man had a miraculous, wonderful healing ministry. It was the holiness that was Christ's holiness in him, but he lived that life in belief. You see, sometimes I find that we, talking about all of us at times, but there's some who live in a complete lifestyle of belief but yet unbelief. If you and I really believe that there is a lake of fire, really believe, as it says in Revelation 20, if you and I really believe that lost souls are going into eternity who will burn the lake of fire uh, forever and ever, if you and I really, really believe that you would not let your family rest. If we really believed it. Problem is we don't know the reality of it. This isn't condemnation. I'm trying to bring us all down to the same level. You see that? If you and I really, really, truly believe that we are one day going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ as believers, guess what? We would be up and ready and serving. We would be 24-7 looking for an opportunity to serve. We would live a life of worship, I'm going to talk about it more God willing on Tuesday night at the Bible study, but we would live a lifestyle of worship, not just coming to a church, a lifestyle of worship, a lifestyle that's pleasing unto God. All of us would, I'm talking about me too, all of us. 
if we really believed what the Word says, we would be radically different for Christ. But even the church has got to a point where it's one meeting a week's enough. Sure, I've already been. I prayed last week. I don't think I'll pray this week. Speaking church, isn't it? Isn't it church? Isn't it really speaking? If we really, truly believe what the Word says, we'd be peddling out of these doors today like a bag of skittles to go and sweeten everyone we could find. If we really believe it. We are to awake to righteousness and sin not, for some of not the knowledge of God. You know what the Paul Paul's saying here, and this is in conjunction or in conjunction with the bodily resurrection at the coming of Christ of the believer. Read First Corinthians fifteen when you go home, and at the end of it, he says, "See, all this is going to happen." He's saying, "Awake to righteousness, Corinthians." You know, the Corinthian church was that bad. You know what they used to say if someone was deeply immoral? What they used to say if someone was totally sinful in all of their ways? Stop playing the Corinthian. You're a harlot, you're a whore, and all that sort of stuff. And the old saying at the time was, stop playing the Corinthian. And Paul's writing it, he's telling them, stop playing the Corinthian, you're a child of God. Stop learning the way of the heathen. Stop, stop taking on their customs. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? But why should I fear him? It's all love, 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 love. He says, no, 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 no. Because the world will come under wrath and judgment. You may not as a believer, but I'm going to tell you where you are going to come out of in a moment. Or come in too. Awake to righteousness means sober up from your drunkenness. A drunkenness of mind. And the word righteousness simply means here one whose way of thinking, feeling, and acting is wholly conformed to the will of God and therefore needs no rectification in their heart and in their life. In other words, what does God's word say? You say, well, you know, we always look for someone's opinion. And if we don't get that opinion, we always go and ask somebody else their opinion, don't we? And then if we do give us the right opinion, we go and get someone else's opinion until someone gives us the opinion we want to hear. Oh yeah, and it's okay. It's all right then, isn't it? No. It doesn't matter if a thousand opinions. It's this opinion. It's the Word of God. And if the Word of God says to you, you must, then you must. And if the Word of God tells you, then you, what it tells you, you must do. If the Word of God says this is what's ahead of you, then it's the love that we're calling out to you, not only as a nation, unto those who are in the world, who are acting like the world, but unto the preachers that we were last week, and now unto the church we're saying, listen, this is a warning call from a loving God. God loves you. But you will stand before Him, church. So God... Proves his love not only by the action he has taken, that is in Calvary, but you know God proves his love to you by the action he still takes. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, please. Now, when we read this, we read this in the context of God humbling his people. God's humbling Israel here. And read this chapter when you go home, for the Lord says that he actually humbled them in the wilderness. 
to show who he was, his love to them. Sometimes love can be tough love, can't it? Let your eye run down just for time's sake to verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to... What's the word? Fear him. Now, go with me to the book of Hebrews into the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. I tell you what, let's go to verse 5. For ye have not forgotten, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. The writer here is telling us that Thank God you're being chastened. I was thinking of this this morning and I was praying this morning and I said, Lord, I want to thank you that at times even though I've moaned and gurned and complained and cried at you for things that you were allowing to happen, I want to thank you that afterwards I see it as the shepherd's crook to pull me back into the way because I was on the road to destruction. And it's because he loved me. If we don't... Chasing our children, we don't really love them because they'll live a life that may lead to destruction. He then goes on to say in verse 10, For verily, for a few days, chasteneth us after their own pleasure. This is our own fathers. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers, what, of his holiness. But sure we are holy in the sight of, yeah, positionally. Practically or literally, you and I are just living in this flesh that speaks of nothing but death. It's corrupt. Let me show you as we close this. I could have done another week, but I'm not. We'll do one. We'll just finish this here. Let me show you as we close this where the believer will be. First of all, Romans 14. Romans 14. You see, believer, you can't live wrong and die right. Romans 14. And let your eye run down to verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? Notice, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's Christians he's right right now too. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That is not the great white throne judgment for unbelievers now. This is you will give an account of how you lived your life before God. You're going to give an account. You're going to give an account on what you built the ministry on. I'm going to give a bigger account than you because of this place and previous things. Because of this word. I'll give a bigger account. I've looked at that last week. But, Christian, we're going to stand before God and you're going to be asked, where were you here? Where were you there? What did you place in front of me there? What about your loves and your loss here? What about your family and your friends there? What about your times out instead of your times where you could have been worshipping me? What about all of these things? What about what you could be doing to to bless others where you didn't? What about the sins that you, the things you could have done and you didn't do? 
that were good. What about those things I laid in your heart you didn't obey? And you will stand and give an account of that. This isn't the ball. We all, you know, we're all going to be raptured up in some mystical cloud and we're all going to run about in our wee white suits and somebody's going to play a white grand piano over there and the clouds are going to be misting all around and we're going to be walking. Oh, there's the party gates in the Golden Streets. Oh, we're going to worship Jesus. Nonsense! We're going to stand before him. You're going to stand before him. And you will give an account. Now you're not going to be lost. You're a believer, you're saved, you're blood washed, but you will give an account. Oh, well, you see, you can't build that all in one scripture. And you're right. Let's go then to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, I as a wise master builder have laid the foundation, and other buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if any man build upon this foundation, notice gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work, what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved so as by fire. Many churches preach that to their congregation. How many churches have you been in and you have heard that preached to the congregation? Because you will stand before God. And while we are pursuing our money, or why, and listen, do well in life, I'm not saying that. And while we're pursuing our things, and while we're pursuing our sports, and while we're pursuing the things of the world, and while we allow it to have power and come under the power of the things of it, all the time, you know what you're doing? You're building wood, hay, and stubble. And be put through the fire. The judgment eyes of Christ. Wow, that's solemn this morning, isn't it? But aren't you glad you know the truth that you can rectify it? Aren't you glad you can rectify it? The idea here, and I'm finishing, and if one more scripture and I'm finishing. Thank you for your attention. That's this series done. You'll be glad to know. But here's the thing. The idea here is that it's believed Paul looked at Corinth and they used to have built uh, like old clay sort of buildings, but a lot of them were made, the cheaper ones were made out of wood and, and packed hard clay just on the wood for their walls. And if there was a fire, there was no fire brigade. There, if there was a fire, it would have went through the building like that and it all collapsed. But those who had built in maybe a bit more money or time and effort, they, they built from the, a good foundation, they built the walls thicker, harder, maybe out of stone or something, and they stood. So the idea here is that Paul is looking at this and saying, your work, if it's not built in Christ for one, and your work, if it's not built in the foundation of the apostles, and your work, if it's not built on the blood, and your work is going to be tried. What you do and how you stand in this life will be tried, and it'll be like going through the fire here. And there's the big holes where the fire was, where the houses that were wood, hen, stubble, and those that were made of more substance, they stood the test of time. I love the bit where it says, but you'll still be saved. But I'll tell you, he says, you'll lose it all, but your salvation. I'll teach sometime on the resurrection and my personal belief in the resurrection. You may agree or disagree, and others may agree or disagree, but I don't believe we're going to be all caught up in a moment the twinkle. Everybody, believer together, I don't believe the scriptures teach that. I believe they'll go up in cohorts. You know what for? Stand before Christ. Do you know what for? We'll go up in cohorts. Because the word there is cohort to go up in. It can be in batches of five hundreds or thousands to stand before Christ. We'll give an account. Every one of us. 
2 Corinthians 5 is our last. Thank you for your attention. It's been wonderful. Second Corinthians 5. Let your eye run down, please. To verse 10. Notice. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. How many is going to appear? All of us. Again, this is not the great white throne judgment. The word judgment seat is the bima. And it's where runners in a race got their reward, but will suffer reward or loss. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. Notice, are you in your body this morning? I hope so. There's no resurrection yet, but the resurrection of Christ. Done in his body, in this life, as we have lived, where we walk and work, as we serve, in faithfulness or unfaithfulness, whether we're trustworthy or untrustworthy, and every idle word that you say will also be accounted for. Every idle word. Scriptures tell us this. And every church is telling people, well, we just hold up our staff and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we bless you and off you go. Now you're in the church. You've been christened or baptized into the church. Nonsense! The only one who can confirm you into the church is the Holy Ghost. So the church languishes and they're told or they've been programmed. God is love. Let's all be nice. Yeah, but love is not all that God is. Now if we really believe what the scripture says, this will change our lives this morning. If we really believe, really believe it, let me get it across. If you and I really believe what this Bible says, it will change our lives. It will change our thinking. It will change our walk. It will change our devotion. It will change how we worship Him. It will change our service. It will change our faithfulness in the church. It will change our faithfulness in the meetings, yes, but it will change our lives, how we live in here and out there. If we really believe it. But what if we don't? Well, then we'll find out it's true in that day because God's word is forever. Settled in heaven. Let me finish this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether good, there's reward, or bad. Good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's what I'm trying to do, church, whether it's here or online, trying to persuade people, persuade men, persuade women, that even though you're saved, get up, get ready, stand up and stand out, reach out and be faithful in the calling of God. You did run well. Who did hinder you, says Paul? Oh, it was all blazing guns at the start, shooting stars, but soon you start to die. If Falster had every backslider return to God tonight, there'd be a revival. The churches would be packed. So in Jeremiah 10, here's the learn not the way of the heathen. For the custom or the custom for the customs of the people are vain. Here that is one the people's practice. Verse 6 says, For as much as there is none like unto thee, Lord, thou art great, thy name is great in might. Here's the prophet's praise. Here's where we should be. But here's the petrified prayer. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? Brothers and sisters, do you see the ones he says, they're brutish? There are those he says, they're brutish and foolish. You know what it means? Brutish means... It gives the idea to be consumed like us with a fire. You know what he's saying? See all those out there? They're consumed with the spirit of lust. 
They're consumed with the things that they desire. They're consumed with worldliness and ungodliness. They're consumed with all the things that they want. They're consumed with all the, the, the desires of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and with the pride of life. It burns them up. It means it burns them up. It burns them. It's the idea of it. They're burning with it. Burning with their desires. Men lusting one toward another. Woman toward a woman. Burning with desire that they can have their life and live their life the way they want it. They'll have their choice and be able to massacre a child in the womb. They're burning with it. They're fighting for it. They're laughing about it and cheering over it. It's the idea of it. He says, don't learn the way of it. The church is going to have craft beer tasting evenings. God forgive them. God forgive them. They're brutish and foolish. No, let me just tell you what it means, foolishness, isn't it, in a nutshell? The Lord says they're thick. That's the word for it. They're thick. And the men with their intelligence, their scientific facts that there is no God and universe, there's a big bang and all this sort of stuff. God says you're thick. I'll say it again so as they hear it. God says you're thick. Aren't we wise unto salvation this morning? Aren't you glad that you're saved? Aren't you glad of the blood of the Lamb? Aren't you glad that Jesus died for you? Aren't you glad that you're made wise unto salvation, but you've got the wisdom of God and the Holy Spirit living in you? That's who we have this morning. That's where we are this morning, church. Come on, church. Live for Christ. Come on, church. Get out of the rut. Come on, church. Get out of the, the slumber and the sleep and awake on the righteousness and sin not. Come on, church. 